We're in the middle of a solar storm fast wind combo with more to come. And we have a massive coronal hole that's so large it could fit seven Jupiters side by side at its widest point. But no worries, this one's more bark than bite. Those stories and more in the news this week. If you want to learn how weather from our star causes impacts at the Earth that shape the future of our world, join professors Dr. Jenny Meehan, Michael Cook, and myself as we guide you through a space weather certificate program like no other. To enroll in the space weather and environment science program offered at Millersville University, go to millersville.com edu slash swen. It's weather for the 21st century. This forecast also sponsored in part by CW Ops. Space weather this week is giving us kind of a combination blow between fast solar wind and solar storms. As we take a look at our Earth-facing disk, there are a lot of active regions in Earth view, but they're not taking center stage. If you've been paying attention over the last day or two, you know that we've been getting some decent aurora clear down to places like Kansas and Oklahoma, even Nevada in the United States. And it's because of some fast solar wind from, believe it or not, this teeny tiny coronal hole, along with something special. If you take a look at the east side of this uh, coronal hole, you'll watch a dimming develop. Watch it right here, whoosh, see that? That was a stealthy solar storm. In fact, as we take a look at it in coronagraphs, you don't see all that much because that's the whole thing about being stealthy. You see something right here, which is likely not it. But this right here, this was a filament kind of launching up this way. And I believe this stealthy solar storm kind of piggybacked along this. And as it extends out, Further here, you can see it kind of dropping down into, you know, kind of the equatorial region. So this was likely part of this stealthy solar storm that was Earth directed. And hey, as it piggybacks on that fast solar wind, it sure can boost those levels. So we've been enjoying some really good storming since then. But the fun is not over. As we continue looking into the 20th and 21st, this uh, region 4028 really started getting active. In fact, on the 21st, it fires a big M-class flare. It's actually not that big, but it had a huge radio burst in it. You can watch it pow right there. This had a big radio burst in it, high enough to kind of get some, degrade some GPS signals. It was pretty impressive. But along with that, it also, you can see a dimming region. I'll back up just a smidge. See that dimming region right there? Yeah, that is yet another part of it. What looks like a stealthy solar storm. As we take a look in coronagraphs, it's not quite so stealthy. You can actually see this near full halo right here. And that means this thing is basically earth directed but because it's so wispy it really doesn't have the strength to kind of push the slow solar wind ahead of it so it got lost in traffic and slowed it down so even though we were expecting to see a much bigger storm hitting a lot earlier well it's only just arrived now and it's likely not going to boost us up to maybe g1 possibly g2 levels by the time all of this is through so we're paying attention to that we could get some decent aurora shows from that and and believe it or not, that's still not the only solar storm. We've got one more. You can see a little bit of something here, a little bit of something here, and a little bit of something right there as well. And as we take a look at this in coronagraphs, well, we get some kind of you know, wispy structure again coming out, kind of out like this. You can actually even see a little bit in here. So once again, it looks like something that's partially Earth directed and we could see more storming from this structure right around the 26th or so. So we've got stuff that's hitting now. We got stuff that's hitting on the 25th and probably some, maybe some glancing blow in the 26th, right ahead of the fast solar wind that we're gonna be seeing from this massive coronal hole. Now, for those who have been paying attention to people on on social media saying this coronal hole is uh, going to be a planet killer. Please don't worry about it. Yeah, it's big. In fact, I measured it. It's You could fit seven Jupiters side by side by side by side by side all the way across the widest point of this coronal hole. And get used to these coronal holes. They're going to be with us for the next year and a half. But believe it or not, this is 
much more bark than bite because this coronal hole has the wrong polarity to cause storming at Earth. So yeah, we might get some fast solar wind, but it's going to act more like a bumper car against Earth. Earth is really just going to be kind of buffeted by it. We're not going to see massive storming. In fact, we might only get to G1 levels from all of this fast solar wind. So, you know, don't worry about it so much. It's really not that big a deal. And this little whatever that was, if that were eruptive, that actually is probably going to go southward of Earth. So don't expect too much from this coronal hole. It's probably not going to be overwhelming in terms of big solar storms or big aurora. Now, taking a look at our sun's far side, we are back to looking at Stereo A imagery because Stereo A is now rotated further away from Earth view. In fact, as we can see here, here's Earth, here's the sun, and here's Stereo A looking at the sun a little bit from the side. Now, what I wanted to show you with this is that, yes, you can see some of the regions that are in Earth view still, but let's take a look at region 4018 because this region was a player on the Earth uh, when, it, when it was in Earth view, but it's now rotated to the sun's far side and watch it right here. Ready? Boom! Right there. Did you see that? That was a nice solar storm launch, a pretty big one. So region 4018 is still a, a big uh, solar storm producer and continues to survive its far side passage. Now, as we take a look at our JSOC HMI helioseismology far sided viewer, you can see here's the front side of the sun and then here in gold is the far side of the sun. And as you can see this right here, watch region 4018 rotate to the sun's far side. So that's let you know kind of where we are right now with 48 rotating kind of out of Earth view, but stereo is still able to see it. But look at this. Do you remember region 4012 and 4011? These were big players too. They are definitely surviving their far side because you can see how dark they are. And along with region 4016, uh, these regions are going to be rotating into Earth view in about five days. We also have region 4014, which was just beginning to grow the last time we saw it, and it's about to rotate into Earth view. So we do have some regions on the sun's far side that are likely going to be bringing us bigger solar flares and are potentially solar storm producers. So we've got a few more days to kind of deal with the fast solar wind stuff here before these regions really rotate back in and take center stage again. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders expect that we're going to be dealing with solar storms and fast wind for a little bit longer, but those radio blackouts are going to return sooner than you think. And now stepping outside to take a look at our current conditions with our global geochron map, you know we've been having a lot of aurora over the past 24 to 48 hours. In fact, as we take a look at our ovation auroral power, you can see it really began to peak late on the 22nd. In fact, we reached G2 levels pretty much when the auroral oval was sitting over the western hemisphere. This allowed for some great views clear down as far south as Oklahoma and Kansas and Pennsylvania, Massachusetts, even New York got some gorgeous aurora despite having a lot of light pollution. But sadly, the aurora dimmed shortly thereafter. In fact, it didn't rise again until the auroral oval kind of rotated over the eastern hemisphere in Russia. Then we got a little bit of a peak again. You can see it right here, but it didn't last all that long. We got maybe a little bit down here uh, in the morning hours for uh, those of you in down under. But it just, we never saw those same uh, levels again that we saw over the Western Hemisphere. Now, as we switch to our Roti G GPS scintillation risk, you can see Roti is actually showing a lot of scintillation risk, especially at high latitudes, and that's because of the uh, active aurora that always seems to make GPS scintillate a lot more, meaning it's kind of gets like twinkles, just like twinkle, twinkle, little star, and that becomes a bit of a problem. So expect that if you're dealing with GPS uh, signals, at, especially at high latitudes. Now, as we take a look at the HF band, so slightly lower uh, frequencies, well, we haven't been seeing a lot when it comes to big solar flares. There's been a couple pops here and there. It's not been too bad, but really we've been staying in the low, you know, lower frequency range and expect that to continue over the rest of this week. It's going to be next week where we're going to get the chance for big radio blackouts again, especially in the HF bands. So amateur radio operators and emergency responders, well, you got a little bit more time for the day side bands to enjoy some good DX. And during the amazing solar storming we've had over the past couple days, there have been some gorgeous aurora photos taken all over the world. And since I haven't done an aurora highlight for quite some time, I thought I would share a few of them with you. Now, this gorgeous one from Poland. And there was gorgeous red aurora in Russia. And we had beautiful curtains in Sweden. And as we move over the pond 
into the Western Hemisphere. Here's some gorgeous views in the Yukon and beautiful views in Ontario. And we saw gorgeous aurora in Manitoba. We also saw beautiful views in Alberta. Of course, Alberta. And as we dipped down into the United States, aurora was seen in New York. It was also seen in Massachusetts. We had gorgeous aurora in Missouri. And it reached as far south as Oklahoma. We saw it in Nevada. And we also saw it in Kansas. And now switching to our moon, we are now passing through the third quarter phase on our way to a new moon, with the new moon being on the 29th. So you night sky watchers, if you want to catch those dim objects in the sky, like, I don't know, maybe some aurora from all of this activity, well, now is your perfect chance. Now, switching to our solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week, we are anticipating that that solar storm that's hitting us now is going to continue to boost levels of uh, aurora possibilities. At high latitude snow is expecting major storm conditions with up to about a 15% chance of a severe storm. I'm kind of downgrading it just a little bit because I'm just not expecting all that much. Now, we also have a solar storm that we're expecting to either hit us or graze us on the 25th and possibly into the 26th. So I've got a storm watch expecting us to stay at minor storm conditions with up to about a 75% chance of a major storm at that point. So expect to kind of die down just a little bit. Then by the 26th, we should be seeing a, a wind watch because we have that big coronal hole that's going to be sending us some fast solar wind. But know that we're not going to be getting some really intense storming from that because it's just not the right polarity. So at high latitudes, going to expect to continue to see minor storm conditions at a G1 level, maybe about a 10% chance of major storm conditions, but probably not all that uh, intense. So Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you could get a show, definitely, but don't expect it to be as strong as the previous forecasts indicated. Now, at mid-latitudes, well, we're still expecting minor storm conditions uh, from the, this storm that is hitting now. That could bump us up to G1 levels here pretty, pretty soon. 25% chance of a major storm, but then likely going into active conditions uh, starting on Tuesday, even though we do have yet more storms coming. We do have about a 15% chance of major storming uh, on Tuesday. And then Wednesday, again, it's kind of dimming things down a little bit, not expecting a lot as we move into the fast wind. But if you're dead dedicated Aurora Chaser, well, it might be worth a look. Now, switching to our solar flare and dayside radio blackout outlook over the coming week. Well, we're sitting at 170 right now for solar flux. We're probably going to dip down just a little bit before building back up. And that's because we have this massive coronal hole that's kind of making the sun look a bit on the dark side. Well, NOAA is giving us about a 30% chance of M-class flares at an R1 to R2 level radio blackout. And that's going to be over the next three days. Expect minor noise on the radio dayside radio bands this week likely going to pop back up to moderate noise levels starting around Thursday and into the weekend because of some new regions that are going to be rotating into Earth view. But expect the chances for R3 level radio blackouts to stay extremely low this week and probably into next week as well. So enjoy the DX as best as you can get it on the day side. In fact, as we get into that fast solar wind, you might notice your radio communication actually gets a little bit better. And that's one of the benefits of having the wrong polarity coronal hole. So that could be good news overall. And now switching to our radiation storm and polar aviation outlook over the coming week. Well, everything is in the green this week. We are sitting at the D1 normal range. This is at flight level 360 for you aviators. It's also the S0 quiet range for everyone else. NOAA's only giving us about a 5% chance of a radiation storm at an S1 to S2 level. And that's going to be extended easily through the rest of this week because we just don't have any big flare players on the Earth facing disk that look like they have any potential for radiation storms. So you frequent flyers, and this does include air crew and you high-risk passengers, enjoy this week. We probably aren't going to see much of a change and just start paying attention possibly next week as the bigger regions rotate into Earth view. 
So the space weather this week is keeping us on our toes. We're kind of getting those combination blows between solar storm and fast solar wind, and this is going to continue. Aurora photographers, if you're at high latitudes, you're definitely going to get some decent shows over the entirety of this week. Aurora photographers at mid latitudes, well, shows may be a little bit more dim than you'd like them to be, but with the dark moon, you could see some decent shows, especially if you get lucky enough to catch those substorm onsets. Now, amateur radio operators operators and emergency responders, well, it's not all doom and gloom for you this week. We do have the storming on the night side, and that does have a tendency to disrupt things a little bit. But you know, if you wait until that fast wind from that big coronal hole hits, well, because of the magnetic polarity of that, uh, of that fast solar wind, it actually may help improve radio communication for you. So let's keep our fingers crossed for you there. And now you GPS users, well, you know, the risk for scintillation isn't all that great this week. We have a lot of aurora happening, and especially on the night side, this could be a problem for you. So you want to stay anywhere away from the auroral zones as much as you can. And, but luckily, we don't have any big radio blackouts this week. So the day side should be, especially at mid and low latitude, should be a little bit better for you. But I would make sure that I stayed vigilant. And if you happen to be a drone flyer, be sure to calibrate your magnetometers often. I'm Tamara the Scove, the Space Weather Woman. Thank you for watching.